descend from the homeland. <laughs> I descend from the homelands of um, the Red River Settlement. Uh, I'm currently a University of Toronto Scarborough student, and I'm taking international development studies. So I'm here to talk from a student's perspective. Yeah, thanks. Amazing. And uh, it only makes sense to go to Danielle Kwan LaFond, who is also from the Scarborough campus. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Danny Kwan LaFond. I work at University of uh, Toronto Scarborough campus. So we are on the lands of the Williams Treaties. Uh, the main campus of Toronto is uh, downtown on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, and all of that is uh, the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek Nation. Um, so my work is, uh, I work in the sociology department, but I do a lot of work in the area of Indigenous and settler colonial studies in Canada. Um, my particular interest is in community engaged work. Um, I do not self identify as Indigenous, although I'm part of the community, I'm mixed race. And so because of that, I bring community into all of my coursework. Um, and so I, a couple of my projects include the Indigenous Garden on campus, and I have a wonderful knowledge keeper who helps me grow things. Um, and Alexis is one of the students who also worked in the garden. Um, and then I'm here to talk about uh, an international Indigenous course that I run focused on UNDRIP, and we travel to territories in Costa Rica. Thank you. I am so excited to learn all about it. Uh, and last but definitely not least, I'd like to introduce David Bush. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, my name is David Bush. I'm First Nations uh, on my mother's side and Scottish and German on my father's. On my mother's, I'm Nishka and Gitsan. Uh, so my traditional territory is in the northwestern part of uh, British Columbia. Today, I'm zooming in from the traditional Lekwungen territory uh, on um, also a place that is very important to the Usanish people. So uh, grateful to be here uh, on campus at UVic. Um, I, my role at UVic is Indigenous Co-op and Career Coordinator. Um, I was pr previously the Indigenous Student Recruitment Officer, so I've been with UVic for almost three years, uh, and I've been in my current role now for uh, just over nine months. Um, so I've learned a lot uh, in terms of Indigenous work integrated learning and co-op, and excited to contribute to the conversation today. Thank you so much. So I would like to get this uh, wonderful webinar started. So I'm gonna start, uh, I'm gonna go with Danielle. Um, my first question is for you. Uh, what are the challenges to securing long-term sustainable funding for course-based study abroad projects in the post-secondary institutions? Uh, so funding is my biggest challenge, <laughs> but, uh, and let me say that I, the project that I run in Costa Rica has followed me through two institutions. So previously I was the coordinator of an indigenous studies uh, program at Centennial College, which is in the same city as my university. Um, and so I started this project under Centennial College and ran it several times there. So I have a community partner in Costa Rica, which is Tech University. And so something that is part of my planning and kind of philosophy to doing these kind of trips is recognition that there it, it is not equal north south. And so the institutions that we partner with, uh, in my case in Costa Rica, uh, Tech University is one of the five public universities, but has nowhere near the available resources for their students. Um, also interesting to think about that the, the kind of funding and um, supports that we have increasingly, uh, we need more, but increasingly we have supports for our indigenous students in Canada, that kind of support does not exist in Costa Rica. So the first thing about planning and funding is that I would say if you're coming from the global north and from an institution of privilege, uh, like certainly like the University of Toronto, where I'm at now, um, it's really important to think about um, the unequal funding from the partner. And so I include community costs in the cost of my trip. That is a, that is a, a cost on my end to include community. And so I'm, um, I've worked hard to try and figure that out. I have internal grants from the university. Um, and I know that I've run a couple of different trips like this. We've had a mix of internal and external funding. Um, but obviously, you know, in terms of sustainability and long term planning, it's a tricky thing to do a course every year where you're writing grants every year to fund your course. And so something that institutions, you know, generally are thinking more about is permanent funding for these kinds of 
uh, trips and travel. Uh, some, you know, we have an international department. And I'll say that some of the challenges to running an indigenous focused trip is that our numbers are purposely small. And that's a challenge for um, the scope of funding often that institutions want to offer. So they want to see, you know, a high number of students impacted, for example. Um, in our case, we think about that because we're traveling to very small communities, like they literally cannot accommodate more than 20 people at a time. And so that's also a piece of our funding that the reality of these kinds of trips is they are more per head than, than other trips. At the same time, I say that having planned trips to the South and knowing that, you know, the cost of our travel South is far less than, for example, you know, a study abroad trip that's going to Italy or somewhere in Europe. So perhaps it's comparable, but I do think that there are particular costs with respect to working with Indigenous communities that are unique to these kinds of trips. And one of our challenges is translating that into institutional kind of language. Um, yeah, and so the, the short story is it's many small pools of funding to make one big project. Can you talk a bit more about the work that you are doing in Costa Rica and, you know, potential like what you're looking for is the outcomes from it, I guess. Yeah, so the course that I run is a course focused on UNDRIP. So and Alexis can tell you more about the actual what what it's like to be on these intense travel experiences. Um, but it comes from a kind of a pedagogy of land based learning. And experiential learning, which are different land based learning is about decolonization and land back and that's a big focus of our discussions with communities so those are political and policy discussions um as opposed to experiential learning which has less of a political focus and is more about you know being in place and what does it mean to do and learn so that's the pedagogy of the trip we travel for 16 days we partner with tech university in costa rica and i think the unique piece is that they also have indigenous students um, similar to our institutions, they have a very small number of Indigenous students, um, and we travel at the end of their year so that their students are off and have just finished exams. And then our students and those Indigenous students, there's about eight or 10 uh, at Tech University. Um, so I partner with their faculty who then organize the students and the students kind of do a mini two day meet and greet. Um, we spend a couple of days at the university and we learn about the communities that these the Costa Rican students are from because we travel to their communities, but they are with us as our hosts. Um, and so my students are then prepared for not only like cultural protocol, knowledge sharing, you know, what are the what are the customs? Some communities have, you know, different customs around photography and things like that, and others don't. Um, so that's the focus of the trip. And the, the students do kind of an intensive course in uh, at U of T in class before we travel and they do all their hard academic work and their essay writing. And then once we travel, it's just being in place and experiencing and learning. And so <clears throat> the outcome of that kind of trip is, I mean, really, I hope that it changes them. I'm very interested uh, in settler colonial policy and in the ways that real life is impacted by these huge policies that exist. Um, Costa Rica is maybe a little bit more advanced on UNDRIP in terms of making it a real legal uh, tool with accountability. Um, so it's interesting for, you know, for our Indigenous students especially to see uh, how that plays out in the lives of, you know, a single person, a community. And also, I think that for Students who come from Canada and because of what settler colonialism has done here to cultures, languages, you know, it's a really interesting, unique, life changing experience to travel to a community where they've never lost their language. They have a continuous history um, of culture for thousands of years and and were not impacted in the same way. And so that also lends to idea sharing, strategizing about how you respond. To colonialism and the pressures um, there and then just you know sharing experiences like to see indigenous students kind of nation to nation to connect over similar cultures clans etc um yeah it's life-changing for some of these students sounds amazing um i think it's a good fit to head over to alexis 
Um, as an Indigenous student, what lessons will did you take away from travel and learning your experience? Like, what was, like, I'm excited. I wish I was there. Um, but, like, what was it like for you as an Indigenous person? Like, she had mentioned there's all the synergies and, you know, learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, as an Indigenous student, it was, like, I got to learn how to um, share and, like, be open-minded and learn from practices that were pretty different but then also similar from mine so it was more like it was a lot of lessons on um interpersonal connections and like how to approach sharing knowledge without knowledge mining because you don't want to like continue any of the struggles that all of us have been through so like um understanding on a deeper level of the struggles that we've each gone through that are so different because the colonization that happened in within Costa Rica was very different from the situation of like my peoples or other peoples in Canada. So then you got to understand like the con context of where um, each group was at and how the difference of colonization affected each of us because we're, we're all in very different places currently. Because as Danny was saying, um, a lot of these communities in Costa Rica currently have um, language and like strong cultural background and like are still placed on their traditional homelands, even though it has shrunk con considerably. But a lot of us within like so-called Canada um, are no longer on our homelands and are either on reserves on different lands than our ancestors or we're not on them at all and don't have our languages. So comparing stuff like that and just being able to share through stories, you remember and learn the policies a lot stronger. Like it's embedded in my brain because I had it through conversation of people who experienced it instead of just reading it in a book because you can find most of the policy and how it's affected people within like articles and stuff, but um, it's like understanding and seeing how it physically affected somebody in that place, um, just like makes it more real or easier to understand and like empathize and understand the context behind it. So um, yeah, and just being able to share like traditions um compare what's similar was very like impactful for me because there was some similar traditional stories that I connected with Indigenous students there on and it's just interesting how we can be so far away um but share similar practices and it just shows like how knowledge was spread pre-colonization and how um like I don't know how all of us interacted pre like yeah pre-colonization so I got to learn a lot about that that's amazing I feel like um <clears throat> for me um anytime I needed anything to be shared I just had to call my grandma mm -hmm. it was the moccasin telegraph and then I knew the whole family would know within 35 minutes so <laughs> yeah. you gotta wonder how she would have managed back then like I don't know <laughs> carrier pigeons I have no idea um <laughs> But yeah, it is, it's crazy because in Canada, we have such different, like all the communities are so different as well. And then, you know, there's some similarities. So it's interesting that even so far, there's still some similarities where, you know, mm -hmm. Canada, we're close to each other and we're completely different. Um, I want to move on to David. Um, so what is your role and responsibilities as the Indigenous Co-op and Career Coordinator at UVic? Yeah, so um, in my role, I work primarily with Indigenous students. Uh, just to back up a little bit, uh, UVic, uh, the Indigenous Co-op Coordinator position is, is one that's kind of emerging in, in, in primarily in um, post-secondary institutions in BC. Um, at UVic, it's been around, uh, I think for about six years or so, but has only, uh, has only been recently um, elevated to a full-time position. It was previously a, a 0.5 position. Um, and UVic obviously saw the need to, to elevate that uh, to a full-time position. And so, uh, again, I work primarily with Indigenous students at UVic. We have uh, over 1,500 Indigenous students, um, making up around 7% of our student body. And UVic has the, the goal of making uh, 
uh, having Indigenous students make up 10% of their the student body uh, just in the near future over the next five years or so. Um, so there will be an increasing demand for an Indigenous co-op coordinator. So, so in my role, um, it's, it's different than um, other co-op coordinators. Uh, other co-op coordinators look after programs, and I look primarily after a demographic of students, uh, obviously being Indigenous students. And so um, depending on what program uh, the student's in, they'll be assigned a co-op coordinator. Um, and I'll support uh, the co-op coordinator as well as the student. Um, and so I'm kind of looked at almost as like a, a secondary coordinator, um, supporting all co-op coordinators uh, across UVic as well as Indigenous students. Um, so, so in my role, uh, I, I help students find uh, work in their field of study. Uh, most of that work, uh, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of that work, students want it to be culturally relevant. So work with uh, their home community or for an Indigenous open, uh, organization. Um, so the, the need for that, and then also um, working with employers that want to hire Indigenous students. So, uh, so in my time, the, the nine months I've been an Indigenous co-op coordinator, I've met with a lot of different employers um, across lots of different sectors. Uh, public, private, Indigenous-led, Indigenous-owned, um, who, who are keen and interested to, to hire not just uh, co-op students, but also recent graduates. And so um, in my role, um, kind of what I've learned is, is uh, part of my role is making sure employers are ready to receive Indigenous, uh, either students or, or recent graduates, so kind of that vetting process. And so uh, I often uh, will meet with them and, and have a conversation about the opportunity that they have, and then also asking some basic questions around, um, have you had an Indigenous co-op student in the past? Um, if so, how did that go? If not, um, why are you interested in having an Indigenous uh, co-op student now? Um, what are they going to bring to the table for you? Um, and, and so it's kind of about getting um, getting to the intention around um, the employer's interest uh, in, in having an Indigenous uh, co-op student or recent graduate come work for their organization. And so it's it's really about um, avoiding tokenistic hiring practices. I think lots of um, organizations may be keen, keen to hire Indigenous students, but haven't really put in that work yet to, to have those Indigenous students come in and flourish in, in, in their organization. So, um, so yeah, that's part of my role is, is meeting with employers, um, helping students find culturally relevant work, supporting our uh, co-op coordinators um, across UVic, uh, helping build capacity uh, within other co-op coordinators, uh, helping them have these kind of harder conversations. And um, I also look after uh, our Indigenous co-op and career mailing list. So um, when these type of opportunities that are Indigenous specific come, come to me, I'll send them out um, after vetting. So I'll send out Indigenous specific opportunities to the mailing list. Um, so current students as well as recent graduates uh, are subscribed to that. And then I also look after our uh, Indigenous International Exchange uh, program uh, that takes place in Australia. And I can talk more about that later. So that's uh, kind of in a nutshell, um, uh, my position as the Indigenous Co-op uh, Coordinator here at UVA. Awesome. That's a, a lot of work. You seems like you're doing the job of like four people. <laughs> but I think sometimes it feels yeah, sometimes yeah, like it feels I think that it's way, good but... that you're vetting as well because that is a thing. Like you'll see job postings and it's they want just someone who's indigenous and that's all. It's just a check mark in some cases. So that's you know great that you're not putting, you know, especially vulnerable people in situations that that is the case. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna switch back over to Danielle, spice up the webinar here. Um, what are some of the ethical concerns specific to planning travel to Indigenous territories in other countries? Like, what are, how do you address them? <clears throat> there are many ethical concerns. So uh, the way that I go about my work is I'm partnered with faculty at Tech University. So my entry into the community is through faculty who've been working. I have two or three um, faculty colleagues at Tech who've been working in those communities for a long time. Interestingly, um, Perhaps as a side note, one of the really interesting things about this kind of international uh, institutional knowledge sharing is sometimes we realize that as faculty, we actually have different ways of going about our work. And I'll say to the credit of Tech University, um, they have a, a, an ethic built into their work. Um, you know, whereas we do teaching and research in our jobs, right? Um, at Tech University, all professors must do teaching, research, and outreach. 
it's actually part of their uh, mandated jobs. So it's structured differently, which means they have time and resources to do that. So, uh, so I partner with two or three faculty who do research in Indigenous communities, um, who have Indigenous graduate students who work with them. And then, you know, over many years, kind of slowly getting used to the community and them getting used to us. So for example, um, our first trip, we stayed in a hotel. Our second trip, we were invited to stay in the community, which, you know, is its own challenges for my students. Um, Alexis can tell you about staying with no Wi-Fi, lots of bugs, and um, yeah, it was intense, where we have to, you know, take a riverboat for an hour to get to the community. Um, so, so I wait for invitation. I follow the lead of those colleagues of mine in Costa Rica who um, are very used to the community, and it's it's by invitation. Also, all of those community members are compensated, so knowledge keepers, the Indigenous students who are acting as ambassadors for their culture, um, speakers, anybody who we meet and interact with who is doing work for on our behalf um, is compensated for their time. Uh, and ethically, I also, you know, I'll say that it's, there's a burden on Indigenous students on this trip. And I recognize that, you know, Alexis and other Indigenous students carried a lot of that kind of nation to nation work, right? So when you go into a community in, in territories here, you say who you are, there's gift giving protocol. They did an amazing job of thinking about that. And I was able to, you know, I've been there enough times to have a sense of what the protocols are down there and, you know, efforts are appreciated. We had students from here who shared about smudging and um, and other, you know, Alexis taught a bunch of uh, university students how to do Métis jigging. Um, so, so yeah, ethical concerns are paramount. Um, it's why we spend a month in class together before traveling. Uh, we put a lot of work into student selection. Yeah, yeah. So I'm happy to answer other specific questions about that, but I hope that helps. No, that did. <clears throat> I think that's, um, I think for some people who were wondering, like, what is the benefit to the community? I did see a little bit of the question. I know I'm not supposed to read it to the end, but I did. Um, so my next question is actually for Alexis. Um, what was the most meaningful about the Indigenous Focus Study Abroad trip for you and your peers? Um, I feel like I probably had a different perspective than some of my peers because there wasn't very many of us Indigenous students that um, are on our campus and could come on the trip. So I was approaching it more from like a spiritual um, like aspect because I, I don't know, but um, it was just the most meaningful part was the connections with the Indigenous people down there that I built relationships that I still talk to them today. And we still like share um, our differences in culture and dance and practices today. And that's just like priceless for me. And without this trip, I never would have ever been able to do that. Um, and to like the, the pre relationships that had to be built for me to even get in to meet those people. I'm just like so grateful for because um, that took years and years. And so that's what was most meaningful for me. And then I feel like um, my colleagues that went with me that are part of the settler population probably um, found it most meaningful to just like the learning process of it and understanding maybe Indigenous culture and practices more through um, an experience of the Indigenous people sharing with them and them just being able to be listeners and like open learners and um, being in a comfortable space because I know a lot of people have hesitation of when they can go places and what customs there are and then therefore they'll just cut themselves off completely because they don't want to put themselves in a vulnerable situation or like a situation they just don't know so the class kind of sets up a safe environment for both indigenous and non-indigenous people to come together to share um knowledge and perspectives which is like 
what reconciliation is all about. So I think maybe they, from my other colleagues from that perspective are um, appreciative of the learning experience. But, no, yeah. I love that. And I think it also opens up eyes that it's not just, you know, Canada or North America that has Indigenous people. I think a lot of times people forget that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like, I know I attended an event and they had some people Maori come in and I actually had someone who was, he was a corporate sponsor sitting at my table being like, I had no idea that there was Indigenous and Aboriginal people in other countries. And I'm like, how does this guy have a master's? Like, I just, <laughs> I glossed right over. I'm like, wow, that's wonderful. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to go to David. Um, I know um, you had mentioned some of the programs and things you're doing there. So I was just curious if you could actually um, dig a little deeper and just like, what does, do the students have access to? Um, what are the programs that are being offered at UVic? Yeah, no, I feel um, really lucky to be working for UVic and, and supporting our Indigenous students. So um, just speaking to some of the kind of programs and services that Indigenous students have access to here. Um, so uh, they have uh, financial support in terms of Indigenous specific scholarships and bursaries. Uh, they have we have a, an elders and residence program. Um, so uh, through our First Peoples House, we have um, elders every day of the week uh, come that uh, students can come connect to for uh, kind of cultural support. Um, our First Peoples House is uh, located in the heart of the campus and. and uh, Kind of what's been said and, and what it, it, the purpose is, is to have that be kind of a home away from home for our, our Indigenous students on campus. We also uh, offer our students, uh, uh, all students at UVic can access uh, counseling services, but we also have two Indigenous uh, counselors that um, Indigenous students can access as well um, who, who treat mental health from more of a, an Indigenous perspective. And so they have that option. Um, uh, and then uh, things like the uh, Lenongit uh, program, which uh, that's a suite of programs. So um, Lenongit is a Sinchoptin word for, um, it, it kind of means paddling a canoe through a storm and making it through to the other side. So UVic kind of recognizing that university can be challenging. And so uh, Lenongit is, is kind of representative of, of that challenge and making it through university to the other side as, as a graduate. And so within um, the Lenongit suite of programs, there's uh, our Campus Cousins program, which is back up and running. Um, it was it was on hold due to COVID, but our Campus Cousins program is a great program where um, in, indig young Indigenous leaders who are current UVic students kind of support community building at UVic uh, by hosting different programs and events for all Indigenous students to come to. And it kind of builds that uh, sense of community on campus um, for Indigenous students. And it's really cool to witness and, and, and uh, be a part of just secondarily. Um, there's also a new networking um, kind of program that happens uh, each each week in, at the First People's House. And it's a chance for um, different faculties and departments around campus, as well as uh, external employers to come and kind of showcase the, the opportunities that they have that are specific to Indigenous students. Um, and then kind of last but not least is our uh, Indigenous uh, International Work Integrated Learning Exchange Program. Um, and so, uh, again, I can talk a little bit more about that later, but uh, um, it, it's also another uh, kind of program that uh, our Indigenous students uh, can access. And it's uh, when I first learned about it, it kind of made me jealous because, uh, uh, to be honest, I, I was like, oh, I wish I was a student again going to UVA because I, I, I wanted to take part in it. So, yeah, um, maybe if you could talk a bit about it, actually, that would be great. Like, yeah. I would love to learn more about it. I think, especially the audience would love to know. Yeah, no, happy to do so. Um, so, yeah, as the Indigenous co coordinator, I, I look after the outgoing students. Um, and, and one my colleague, uh, Renee, and, and people at our IACE office, so IACE, I know we're talking in acronyms, but it's our Indigenous Academic and Community Engagement Department uh, at UVic. And so uh, my colleague, Renee Liebernas, she looks after the incoming students um, from Australia. So uh, the, the exchange program, it, it is work integrated learning. So our students go on a, a co-op, uh, usually 13 or 14 weeks. Um, with one of our three partner institutions. So our three partner institutions are RMIT, um, Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology uh, in Melbourne, University of Newcastle uh, in Newcastle, and then University of Macquarie in uh, Sydney. So those are our three partner institutions and those uh, are three of the different institutions that our students can go to um, for a co-op work experience. And it doesn't necessarily, like it, 
it, a student can be in kind of any program at UVic and our partner institutions can, can still make a co-op work. So um, I know in the past we've had students from um, science, social science, humanities. We've had some students uh, just recently, one who was a, a biology and psychology student and one who was in civil engineering just uh, complete their co-op in uh, Macquarie. Um, and the, the exchange pieces, uh, Indigenous students uh, from Australia come to UVic and do an academic term as well as a community internship. So that's where that work integrated learning piece comes in. And so uh, the, the exchange itself has been around um, for almost 10 years. And uh, we try to aim for having about two, receiving two or so, like about two students receive and, and send two. And uh, the reason for us, it's not really about necessarily necessarily the quantity, but more the quality of the experience. We want uh, Indigenous students to, to be successful on their co-op and the students who come also have a successful uh, academic term and, and, and community internship. And um, so I think in total, we've uh, sent about 11 students and received um, maybe 13. So almost one-to-one -one parity. And, um, and yeah, the, the quality of that experience. So students uh, that participate have to have completed one domestic co-op and the Lanai prep seminar, uh, which is taught by, again, Renee Levinash. And that's kind of about um, making sure students are, are ready to, to go on the exchange because it, it is a big exchange and students are going to be gone for an extended period of time. And, and we don't want those students to feel isolated or, or um, like, you know, what have I gotten myself into? So we want to make sure they're prepped for, for that experience. And, and it, it is a big experience because it's also about kind of that cultural exchange. Students go there and share about kind of uh, what they know about their own personal history and as well as Indigenous uh, history in Canada. Um, and then they also get a chance to learn about Indigenous history in Australia. So there's that big cultural exchange, um, which is vital to the, the program. And so the, the co-ops themselves uh, tend to vary depending on the, the program the students are in, but that cultural exchange piece is one that's a staple to the program. Um, yeah, so that, that kind of uh, highlights the, the program. Um, but yeah, uh, again, happy to answer any more questions that uh, the audience has relating to it. That's awesome. Um, I like the idea of like just learning from each other. I'm actually doing an event with two corporate partners, um, a nonprofit based out of BC in uh, the fall for a youth event for 18 to 35. Um, I'm sure Liz will be a part of it because I always love working with her. Um, and we're bringing in, we like, so I'm definitely gonna be reaching out to you lovely people. I wanna bring in Aboriginal people and Indigenous people from other countries. And we're hoping to get two represented from the nine countries that Liz works with. Um, yeah, to bring everybody together and, you know, do entrepreneurial and financial literacy and some culture um, sharing. So I find it's interesting that Matt put all of us together because it all kind of just ties together. So I found that pretty cool. Um, we do, we are at the point now to be asking questions. <clears throat> so I was going to just take a look here. We had a couple, I don't know if everybody else can see them. So the first question is from Craig, and um, this is, I believe, for Danielle. It just says, from your description, it sounds like your students are traveling as a group. Um, we ensure this is for young people when traveling as a support system. What other support systems are in place for them as a minority people? So yes, uh, that's a really important <laughs> consideration. So uh, on the last year's trip, I had an Indigenous PA. Uh, sorry, he was not a TA. He was an Indigenous PhD student who was just invited to be kind of a peer support on the trip. And uh, coincidentally, his younger sister was one of the Indigenous students on the trip. Um, so I had him as support. I have an Indigenous TA as well for the trip. Um, I've got three faculty partners in Costa Rica as well as community partners. So we pretty much, it was funny. And I mean, once we all got on the bus, I think there were almost as many faculty, staff, you know, support people as there were students. Um, it, it is, a, it's an intense trip, you know, and we're traveling. I was also conscious that this was the first time any of us had done anything after COVID. So I was taking university students who had never been to university, some of them, they'd never been to an actual classroom. And we, U of T reopened, I think six weeks or eight weeks before we all got on a plane. 
to spend two solid weeks together. So I knew that, you know, like any group is going to have interpersonal tension and people need space and some people need to talk a lot. And so those are all considerations, plus all of the cultural pieces. Um, I will say that in recognition of, I think, the specific cultural needs of this kind of group, uh, for my next iteration of this trip, I'm actually bringing an elder, a young elder, somebody who wants to travel to, to the places that we travel to. So that, that's been a challenge. Not every elder could do this trip. It's really hard physically, um, but I have somebody in mind for the next trip. And I think, you know, I said to them that they're, they're the missing middle um, that I needed to kind of connect everything and to support, support students. So um, yeah, so that's that's how I thought about it for this round. Hope that helps. That's awesome. That's good though that there is an elder. It is a challenge sometimes, even when um, in my previous role as a CEO, when we would have events in some communities or outside of the communities and trying to bring an elder into and like a, a rec center or anything like that, like some of them just don't want to travel. Like it's a long drive or um, those small planes that everybody thinks they're going to die in. So, um, but that's wonderful that you found someone who does want to do that. Um, I do have a, a quick question. Well, not a quick question. I was hoping, um, David, you could go a little bit deeper. I'm just curious. So for the UVic Indigenous International WIL exchange, um, what is what is the qualifications? Like, how do you choose that one student? Like, it's it's basically a lottery. Like, it's amazing to win that ticket, like Willy Wonka. So I'm just curious, like, what is the criteria? Like, and how is that chosen, that person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I guess to... There is 1,500 Indigenous students at UVic, but to go on the exchange, you have to have taken a domestic co-op, and not all students at UVic, those 1,500 are in programs that um, are, are eligible for co-op. You know, lots of students, um, some of the programs that are, are most popular with Indigenous students actually have practicas, so like nursing, social work, uh, child and youth care, um, education. Those are quite popular with our Indigenous students. So really, out of that 1,500, it's maybe... Um, about 1100 or so um, just as a, a ballpark number of those students who are who are actually eligible for co-op and so the students uh, that narrows it down and then um, students who uh, go on the exchange have to have taken the Lenong uh, prep seminar so that's uh, again a, a course that kind of preps students not just for the workplace but for uh, kind of the exchange as well um, and then uh, they have to do one domestic co-op so having met those criteria um, and then being interested in the exchange. Um, we, we usually have about two positions um, available and in any given, you know, uh, cycle, I guess, of, of this, um, you know, there'll be a handful of students that reach out. And when the postings go live, it, it's, it's up to um, the employer um, based on the work that they have. So our, I guess our partner institutions, um, the, that the work that they have, um, what students is the most eligible. So it does go to a competition. And I'd say um, on any given uh, cycle, there's probably four or five or six students who are interested and eligible and, and a good candidate to go on the exchange. And there will be you know one or two positions. Um, so it, it really isn't up to, to myself. Um, what I do with these students is make sure that they meet the criteria. And then when the posting goes live, they apply through our kind of co-op and career portal that we have, just the standard um, kind of uh, hiring process that they would have experienced in their first domestic co-op. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, I wouldn't say it's up to me, but it's kind of um, depends on the work that the employer has and who they think is the best uh, candidate based on resume, cover letter, and, and interview. Um, but uh, I, I don't want the audience to think, you know, all 1,500 students are eligible and applying for this one position. There's certain steps that they have to meet in order to be eligible um, to, to apply to the, to the program and the uh, exchange. Um, so, so, yeah, um, I, I guess in a nutshell, it's um, a handful of students. And, and if it's more uh, than the positions that are available, then it, it goes up to competition. Okay, that's, mm -hmm. that's interesting. And um... And I already have anxiety just thinking about applying, but that's just me. I get nervous <laughs> for those things. I'll be like, oh my God, <laughs> but that's amazing. Um, and it is good that there is like a lot of steps in place and it would wean out people, I guess, that maybe not are the best fit or just maybe doesn't align with what they want to do. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, Danielle, about your course, I want to learn a bit more too, kind of the same sort of question. You know, how does it work? How are students chose? Um, that sort of stuff. 
So I'll, let me share that in the uh, long development of this program, I've changed the student requirements actually. And I'm gonna tell you a story about why. <laughs> so in one of our early years, it was open to all students through application. So they had to apply, they had to say why they wanted to go. We take into account, you know, these are always fully funded. So, and I'm happy to talk about that separately, but um, that's part of an kind of an ethical approach to my own work. I really, I don't run these trips unless I have all the money in place to fund every single student before I go. And sometimes that means I take two years to plan. Um, so it's fully funded so that, you know, that helps increase applications. So they apply, they have to do an individual interview and a group interview where we watch them interact on a group task. And because it was open to all students, what happened was I ended up with students who have very average level of knowledge about settler colonialism in Canada, which means they have a lot of myths. And so we were at Tech University uh, in a kind of learning seminar and one of my Canadian students Put up their hands canadian settler student put up their hand and asked one of the costa rican students so they said something like in canada indigenous people get their education for free which is absolutely not true to be clear but that you know many many people misunderstand that and so they said so do you guys like do you indigenous costa ricans do you get everything for free um and i had to stop everything and do the teachable moment thing and 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 really reflect on what you know that that that's that's unacceptable right it misrepresents it badly represents us um as students and canadians and the institution and it led to tension right like we had to have an open conversation about how many myths that canadians just believe about indigenous people so i've changed the requirements and there's now a prereq course that's an indigenized course on the truth and reconciliation commission so the students have to complete a third year TRC course. And the point of that is so that we arrive with a common base of truth and that we can then, you know, build on that learning. But I think specific to doing Indigenous studies, it makes it different from every other kind of trip because there's so much unlearning. Yeah, there's just so much misinformation and we just can't risk reproducing that. So, so my student selection now has a, a strict prerequisite. Um, David, I'm so impressed by you, Vic, and all of what you have for students. Man, we do not have those kinds of resources. We have very few, as Alexis can tell you, very few Indigenous students. I think we have 14,000 students. We might have 50 Indigenous students at University of Toronto Scarborough uh, for lots of good reasons. We are the biggest colonial university and many you know, people are hes hesitate to come for lots of good reasons. So so for that reason, I I seek out indigenous students and I see the question in the chat as well. And and so I do a lot of like one on one outreach. Alexis helps me with this work and the students. I'm like, please talk to this student. You know, I know it's an amazing opportunity for them. I know they're you know, they're doubting it or whatever. Tell them what you did. Tell them it's fully funded. Um, and we just yeah do a lot of outreach to try and encourage people, you know, to come on these trips to remove barriers if it's an I had a student last year who was like I can't travel for two weeks I'm not going to be able to pay my rent you know so I was able to get them funding to pay their rent to make up that gap um so it's a very different situation it's interesting hearing you speak David like you've just got so many more things in place in our case because we have so few students if an indigenous student at UTSC wants to go on this trip and they get in touch with me I mean we can make that happen we can get them in the course that they need and and make sure that they've got funding but it's much more of an individual effort rather than an institutional level effort just because of numbers i think yeah um i'm i grew up in scarborough so i know where your university is and uh it is lower indigenous i think even living in those areas and now with the prices of everything the cost of living there is insane like I, i've seen some of the dorm postings like thousands of dollars for a bedroom so you know i could see how that's a huge barrier to a lot of people um, yeah. There was a, a comment um, just in regards to um, large financial gains for overseas programs, like within both of your institutions, do you find that um, there is a lot of financial gains within your institutions for doing these programs or are you guys struggling to fund these programs? I can jump in. Um, 
uh, and this is, you know, um, from what I know, uh, and there's more on my part that I need to do, you know, to learn about, you know, the, the funding, but from what I know of the funding of this, um, we have, uh, when our students go um, on the Indigenous International Exchange Program, uh, UVic has in place what is called the Strategic Framework Experiential Learning Fund, um, and that funds the students $10,000 to offset the costs of associated with the program. Um, and we know that doesn't cover everything. I've had students reach out to me and say, hey, I'm really interested in going. Um, and, and I've talked to them about the funding that they get and they're like, that's really great and that, you know, and it does cover everything related to the program. But as you said, Danielle, like the students can't give up their place here because housing in, in Victoria, like many places, as soon as you give it up, you, you can't find anything else. Uh, and if you do, it's gonna be more expensive than what you currently have. So that's a huge consideration for students going on this as well. It's like, I still have to pay rent at home. Um, so um, yeah, and we also have the, the Global Skills Opportunity, the GSO funding, um, which also our, our students can access, uh, Indigenous students can access. Um, so between the SFL, the Strategic Framework Experiential Learning Fund, um, as well as the uh, GSO, those are two funding pots that our, our Indigenous students can access. And historically, um, and, and so ever since the program has, has kind of come about, the students, because it's a, a co-op experience, they receive um, a stipend at the beginning of their work term, um, which is usually $5,000 Australian. So it's the $10,000 from the SFL and then a $5,000 stipend uh, from the university for, for their, the work that the students do over the course of the 13, 14 week uh, co-op. So that's kind of the funding that's associated with this. And we found that um, has been great, but obviously doing due to in, inflation, it's, you know, we're having to kind of reassess that with the cost of living. And um, we know that Australia is expensive, but everywhere is expensive. But, you know, um, historically that has been enough, but, you know, we might need to relook at that. And, and that's part of my role is looking at what the students are spending and, and is the funding enough. Um, so, yeah. Um, just in the chat, um, somebody had mentioned um, Veronica from International Canada um, to do an introduction if you either of you were interested in um, Mexico. So she would love to do an introduction. Um, <clears throat> one of the questions we got from an anonymous person, it just says, I'm curious about what advice our panelists have in terms of effective ways to promote study abroad, opportunities and in international engagement to Indigenous students. Uh, most institutions are seeing hesitation from students to participate in international activities. We're hoping to support more Indigenous students to go abroad, especially considering we can provide financial support. So any advice would be appreciated. I have a little bit of advice. I think um, the reason of the hesitation is what David and Danielle, it's the cost associated, although you know you are able to maybe fund it a bit. If you were to give up your apartment that say you were paying 2,500 for last year and move and you come back two years later or six months later, there's a high chance that that's now $4,500 or $4,000, um, you know, and people have cars and insurance and all these fun things that um, you still have to make payments on, right? Like when you go away, it doesn't matter if you're not using your car, creditors want their stuff. So I think that's it. Um, I think it's also the unknown. So when you're going into these countries, um, you're going in blind, you can do as much research as you want, but I think um, that would be a big thing. So I think to get more engagement from those countries that you're trying to get into, is having webinars or workshops with those people that would be helping them on the other side. So at least they have that connection, almost like a guidance counselor, but not really. So then they have that bond, like for Indigenous people, especially um, relationships are everything. So having that relationship and that bond and a better understanding, um, I think would bring more attendance and more engagement. I would love to hear from Alexis on this point. I mean, Alexis is the um, is the model, if if you will. She's from Saskatchewan. She is studying in Toronto. Uh, she's been on a program in Costa Rica, and she's about to do a co-op program on uh, Manitoulin Island, which is sort of uh, made to northern Ontario. So, Alexis, what what are you doing right, and what are you um, what are you taking advantage of as you see it? Yeah, like I completely agree with all those hesitations because I've gone through all of that. And I'm still, because I go on co-op for a year starting in the summer and it'll be gone for a year, but like I live in downtown Toronto. So I'm having the same worries about like, how do I just pop back and I have to still do another year of school and I have to somehow live and find a place to live in Toronto. And 
it is a big hesitation. And um, I wouldn't have stayed in co-op if I didn't know the opportunity was worth like a year of my time, because I think a lot of students um, have a lot to balance. They're like, oh, this program's costing me a lot of money or like my tuition costs me a lot of money. Do I have the time of a year to not be making money and be working as a co-op student and maybe just be getting a stipend or not even enough money to cover it. So I have to pay more into it. And then to have to still finish my degree and do I even have enough money to like sustain a whole year of going abroad, even though it's the best opportunity ever. And then, yeah, the connection piece, like um, it's hard to just move somewhere new and feel like you don't have a safety net there already or that you have people connected to you um because you yeah you're going by yourself like I will be moving to Manitoulin Island by myself but I found the placement through people I'm connected to at UTSC and they're closely connected to people on Manitoulin so I feel like I have a safety net and I um, know about the culture and I they're going to help me find funding. So they're like going through all the possible worries that I have. And they're like, I'm going to help you through this. I'm going to find your resources or I'm going to help you find grants to pay for all of this. So you don't have to worry about like money while you're gone and putting more money than you've already put into this. But I think answering all those questions at the very beginning being so transparent with students is all like the main thing that you need to be doing because a lot of universities will hide things until the very last minute and it just creates more stress and then word of mouth through students ends up giving you um, a bad representation and then therefore indigenous students don't want to put up with stuff like that because they've already been through so much just to get to university and like go through all these classes. Um, so you really have to like promote how these connections from this co-op are gonna help them in the long term find a job, how these connections will help them like, yeah, in the future. And then also how are you gonna help them like survive while they're there? You can't just like give them the opportunity, plop them there and be like, this is all the money we can give you and you have to kind of figure it out because then nobody's going to want to do it. But yeah, I think that's really going through all that stress. <laughs> I would imagine like it, I would I would think, you know, it, it's a lot like you're moving away from your family, your home into a new mm -hmm. culture. So I think um, to answer that question, it's just having more support systems and maybe, you yeah. know, a, a variant of a safety net in place so that they feel secure in their decisions. Right. Yeah, and just setting up the program alone isn't enough. You have to have something, like you have to be accountable for that student past the time when they leave your school and go on co-op. And there has to be like really big support when they're gone too. So it doesn't just stop with like recruitment, you know? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I can't believe it was actually on time because I don't think I've ever had a webinar that's on time. So I'm very appreciative of everybody's punctuality. Uh, we don't have, um, I think we had one more question. Hang on, it just popped up. So if you guys don't mind, um, here it is. Um, what assessments evaluation is there that students taking part in these experiences are engaging in intercultural competence understanding, learning, and are reflecting about Indigenous cultures, and what are they, like, once they complete these experiences, I guess that's more, um, or it could be for both of you, David and Danielle, so if those who have time, please feel free to stay, um, but yeah, what do you guys, like, what do you have in place for those things, like, do you guys have, I don't think a survey, but, like, some sort of um, system in place? I'll quickly jump in, um, uh, we have, so, um, for all co-op students, but this is a co-op, so um, this takes place, and, and I conducted ours for the, the, the students who just completed their um, co-op work experience. 
we have uh, what are called worksite visits. And so we meet with the student as well as their supervisor, just check in, see how, um, just see how things are going. How is the student adjusting? Uh, how are they contributing? Um, what are their successes? What are the challenges? Um, get the student's perspective and then also get their supervisor's perspective. Uh, and then uh, we also have, um, so that's at the mid midpoint and then at the end as well. And then uh, after the students completed the uh, exchange program, we also asked them to uh, submit a kind of a reflective paper. Um, you know, what have they learned? What was their experience like? Um, you know, again, successes, challenges, and, and really, um, what would they recommend to us to, to make the program even better? Um, is there something that we're missing? And something that they have to contribute from their experience that uh, if we implemented would make their the student experience even better. Um, so uh, yeah, that's kind of a little bit about um, what's in place for, for our experiences at UVic. Danielle? Yeah, I'll very quickly share just kind of the assessments for the course. Um, I'm lucky that mine is a course, so then it's structured, you know, as course assessments. Uh, they write one essay before they go, but I know that this kind of travel, once you are in place, uh, writing is not an option. We're also off of Wi-Fi and away from technology. Um, so there is a participation grade that has to do with respecting cultural protocols, learning people's names correctly. Uh, they have to do a blog um, on their experiences in which they're assessed on things like proper photo credit, making sure that they had permission from whoever's story they're telling, you know, all of that kind of cultural piece of how we tell stories, getting permission is built into their um, assignment. Um, and then we do a lot of talking. So we do a lot of reflection on the trip. Um, yeah, most of our evenings are just processing what we've learned. And that is why I have such a big faculty team. Um, there were five or six of us basically in instructor roles to make sure that we could do that. Yeah, I like that. That's amazing. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that you both do have things in place. Um, I'm going to hand this back over to Matt and I will let him wrap this up. Thanks so much, Michelle. You're you're a rock star. Um, just so everyone, I'm probably <clears throat> divulging too much here, but Michelle hasn't been feeling well this week. So um, I can only imagine how good she is at 100%. So uh, thank you for to Michelle and, and to Danny and to David and to Alexis. Alexis, um, I'm going to keep track of your, your trajectory, um, through your, your life and your career, because, uh, you're truly remarkable. So thank you very much. Um, uh, this is going to be a shameless plug for my conference or the conference that's coming up in person in Indianapolis, uh, June 13th to the 15th. You can just visit our website to find out more about attending that conference. And I also wanted to thank, uh, Liz, uh, Hong Farrell with International Experience Canada. Uh, who has supported not only this um, session, but all of our sessions. Um, and then finally, um, this session has been recorded, although I did start a little late. So my apologies for that. And uh, Alexis, uh, thank you for continuing on uh, as, as you heard the uh, recording begin. Um, if you have any other further questions of the panelists, you can either reach out through myself and I'll put you in touch with them, or you can uh, reach out to Michelle directly. This is her information. Um, and uh, everyone that had registered for the session, I will send out a link for the recording. Um, we are uh, three minutes over time, and that is my fault because I asked Michelle to ask one more question uh, just as she was wrapping up. So thanks for doing that, Michelle, and thanks to the panelists. And again, I really appreciate everyone that's online um, showing your, your support and your interest um, in this very uh, important uh subject and um and Danny and David um for sharing your expertise as you as you're leading these programs. So uh, on that note, uh I think I'll end the session. Um but again have a great uh day and uh, we look to see we look forward to seeing you in person in the future or online again very soon. Um, so have a great rest of the day and week and uh we'll speak soon. Thank you. Thank you.